Assalamualaikum. عليكم السلام ورحمة الله دكتور طارق. مساء الخير دكتور طارق. كيف حالك استاذنا الدكتور عصام الدكتور احمد؟ يا اهلا وسهلا دكتور طارق. بالله احنا بدأنا البث على على اليوتيوب فنقدر نبدا دلوقتي ان شاء الله. طيب انا كاتب وقت ما تقولوا لي انا نقدر نبدا. كده دقيقتين بس يتجمعوا الناس. حاضر. مبروك على الكتاب دكتور عصام، كتاب جميل. ما ربنا يخليك الله يفتح عليك ما شاء الله الان 82 دخلوا على على الخط تمام عدد كويس بعد ما ضيعت سنه وشويه في الكتاب جت الكورونا قعدنا في البيت كنا عمل <تصفيق> اعمل كتاب ثاني يا دكتور <تصفيق> عامل كتاب اسئله عن الكتاب الاولاني عشان الامتحانات. تمام جميل اكيد. اه والله انا بعمل كده فعلا. تمام. احنا شيرنا دلوقتي اللينك بتاع اليوتيوب آه على الشات اللي بتحب يتابع اليوتيوب وبرضه هنشيره على الاعلان اللي عندنا هناك على الفيسبوك بحيث برضه الناس اللي متابعه الاعلان على الفيسبوك تبقى متواجده معانا ان شاء الله. <تصفيق> دكتور طارق احنا كده بقينا 100 نقدر نبدا ان شاء الله الان 100 مشترك وصلوا جميل جدا اتفضل فاتح المقدمه طيب بسم الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نرحب بالجميع ان شاء الله وكل عام وانتم بخير ضمن فترة استغلال الحجر الصحي الموجودة في أغلب الدول نواصل برنامجنا العلمي عن الكونتنوس ميديكال ديكيشن هذا المرة سيكون عن القناة الدمعية الكريمال سيستم فروم A to Z مع البروف عصام الطوقي إن شاء الله طبعا بيكون هناك أيضا محاضرة صغيرة للدكتور رامي الشكري عن الكانيلوكولار ستنت فنبدأ مع الدكتور عصام هو بيبدا اظن اناتومي او بيبدا يكون جيلتا نازل في الملدكت بنشوف كيف بيبدا بسم الله دكتور عصام بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ثانك يو دكتور طارق ثانك يو دكتور محمد فؤاد فور الاورجانيزيشن اي انديرستاند ذير ار بيبل هو دو نوت سبيك عربي سو وي ويل تراي تو بي يوزنج ذا انجلش لانجويج وي ديسكاس ذا لاكريمال سيستم trying to take it systemically from A to Z, as we said. Uh, it's, uh, it's very important because uh, lacrimal uh, symptomatology, particularly tearing, is a very common uh, symptom that we hear in the clinic. So we have to understand what uh, goes on, how to manage each type of the lacrimal system. We start by the congenital uh, obstruction, Then we'll go to the pumpkin stenosis, then the canaliculus. Uh, we'll discuss the lacrimal stents, and uh, we'll discuss CDCR, and we'll discuss DCR. Uh, let's start with uh, one of the common congenital anomalies that we all face, which is the nasolacrimal duct obstruction. I know that all of you know by heart this uh, diagram. It's the normal lacrimal system. But there are several points in the anatomy that we need to discuss because they have clinical importance. The two punctile. The two punctile are not exactly opposite each other. 
Actually, the opening of the upper pumpkin is slightly needed to the opening of the lower pumpkin. And this is very critical because when both lids close, the two pump tiles should not lie opposite to each other. Other side, otherwise, they will not drain while closing. And this is important. And there is some diseases of the lacrimal sac where the lids either override or the two pump tiles oppose each other, and this can lead to tearing. Dr. Asam. بس تخلي الفور سكرين على الشاشة السلايد حاضر يا فندم طيب الشغلة الثانية الصوت واضح لدى الجميع الصوت في ناس كاتبة إنه الصوت مش حلو الصوت عندي كويس أستاذنا دكتور عصام السلام عليكم معك دكتور إسلام السلام أستاذنك بس لو لو ترجع شوية لورا هيك شكلك قريب أوي من الكمبيوتر فده بيعمل صدى صوت شوية حاضر Uh, two canaliculi. Uh, I think in the two canaliculi uh, were uh, passed through the two limbs of the medial cancel tendon. And these direct them towards the sac. This is very critical because the angulation of the medial cancel tendon, if it is angulated anteriorly, this will cause a kink in the canaliculi and will lead to epiphora, although the system is open. And this is known as the centurion syndrome. What is the centurion syndrome? The word century means 100, because in the old Roman uh, army, every 100 soldiers had a leader, and this leader used to wear a full suit made of iron. I'm sure you all know the shape of this suit. The mask of the suit has a place for the nose and the nose protrudes anteriorly. This is the centurion syndrome. Due to anterior placement of the nasal bones, the medial cancer tendon has to, instead of being horizontal, it has to move anteriorly to insert in the nasal bone. This results in angulation kink in the canaliculi, and this leads to epiphora. These patients will come to the clinic, symptomatizing with epiphora. You do all the tests, the system is open, yet they have epiphora. You have to look for the shape of the nose. And you have to understand that if they have anterior placement of the insertion of the medial cancer tendon, this will result in epiphora. And the treatment is very easy. You make a small opening over the insertion of the medial cancer tendon, you cut the anterior limb of the medial cancer tendon, immediately the canaliculi will retract and become horizontal again. It takes one minute, the, whole, the, the procedure, and this will cure the epiphora. You will not diagnose the centurion syndrome unless you know it and you look for it. It's very common in Upper Egypt, by the way. A lot of, uh, it presents usually after puberty with the gross of the nasal bone. So it's usually male, more than females, at the age of 15 to 20, who comes of recent onset of epiphora and there is no other uh, reason and the system is open. So this is one important point to know about the anatomy of the canaliculi. The second important point is that the canaliculi are not straight as we draw them. We draw them as if they are straight ducts just because of drawing for simplicity. But like, if they were straight the way we draw them, then with any movement of the lid or any rubbing of the lid or pulling of the lid or movement of the upper lid, they would have been torn. The canaliculi are convoluted. The same way as the optic nerve behind the globe is convoluted because the globe moves. And this is very important when you try to pass a dilator in the canaliculi. If you pass a dilator, while the canaliculi are still convoluted, you will tear the canaliculus. You will, we call it transfiction of the canaliculus, which means that you will go through 
uh, pierce it and go through another part of the canaliculus. The same way if you want to insert the cannula and you transfix the vein. So before introducing any instrument inside the canaliculus, you have to straighten the canaliculus. How do I do that? By pulling the lid laterally, this will straighten the canaliculus, but most importantly, by filling the canaliculus with viscoelastic material. I advise everyone who's going to work on the lacrimal system is not to do any manipulation of the canaliculi until he injects some viscoelastic into the canaliculus. I want to tell you that canalicular obstruction is the single most difficult lesion in lacrimal surgery. The canalicular epithelium is as important as the corneal endothelium. If you, if you inject viscoelastic for the corneal endothelium, then you need to inject viscoelastic for the canalicular epithelium. This will protect the epithelium, will straighten the canaliculus, and will allow you to pass any probe inside the canaliculus. And it is reported that 10% of canalicular injuries occurs by ophthalmologists. While trying to probe, to inject, to syringe, whatever, you injure the canaliculus, and this will take the obstruction to a totally different level and a totally different disease. So straighten the canaliculus, pull the lid laterally, and inject viscoelastic before going on so that you straighten the canaliculus. Then we go to the sac, fundus, body, and uh, the nasolacrimal duct. We have to differentiate between two structures. One structure is a membranous structure called the nasolacrimal duct. And then we have a bony obstruction called the nasolacrimal canal. They are not the same. If you know the ureter, the ureter is a duct, a membranous duct that passes from the kidney to the bladder without a bony canal. The spinal canal, for example, is a bony canal through which the spinal cord passes. The lacrimal system has both, has a membranous duct and the bony canal. And the membranous duct is actually five millimeter longer than the bony canal. So the membranous duct passes in the upper part, 12 millimeter, into a bony canal, osseous canal, and then the lower five millimeter, it's hanging freely inside the nasal cavity under the mucosa the same way as the ureter is hanging freely in the abdominal cavity. Then it pierces the nasal mucosa and opens into the inferior turbinate. Is this important? This is very important. Obstructions in the membranous duct can be treated by coping and syringe. Obstruction in the canal, the osseous canal, cannot be treated by coping and syringe. That's why congenital nasolacrimal duct, where the obstruction is in the membranous duct, can be treated by coping. While other obstruction, which is usually osseous obstruction, can never be treated by coping. No matter what you will hear, no matter what you think is done by force, the obstruction will not be cured. So you have to understand the difference between the nasolacrimal duct and the nasolacrimal canal. The other thing is, where does the nasolacrimal duct open? It opens in the inferior meatus of the nose. Let's remember the anatomy of the nose. The nasal cavity is divided by three turbinates or conchi into four cavities. The inferior meatus, the middle meatus, the superior meatus, and above all is the sphenoismoidal recess or cavity. Where does the nasolacrimal duct open? It opens below the inferior meatus, which means it opens in the uh, below the inferior concha, so it opens in the inferior meatus. If I want to go into the nose from anteriorly, there is the nostril, the opening of the nose from anterior. Which level does this nostril open? If I take, for example, a cotton tip and go through the nose from anteriorly. 
people think that you go into the inferior meatus. This is wrong. When you go from anteriorly, you go into the middle meatus. The inferior meatus is one floor below. It's at the level of the upper teeth of the ginger. Exactly like going, for example, to a hotel, where you go through the street into the lobby of the hotel, but there are floors below where there can be restaurants or a swimming pool or whatever. People who does probing and syringing and go through the nostril, trying to, to feel the probe or to catch the end of the tube, they have to go first one floor down before looking for the tube. دقيقة دكتور عصام. تفضل. في ناس بيقولوا الصوت مش واضح، أنا عندي الصوت واضح. تعليقات كثير بتقول الصوت مش واضح. دكتور طارق معلش يا دكتور عصام حضرتك بتتكلم من مايك ولا بتتكلم؟ أنا بستخدم الكمبيوتر ممكن أنقل على الفور جي يمكن ده يعني لو نقلت. يا ريت يا ريت لو كده ولو عندنا حل تاني إن حضرتك لو لو الصوت مش هيبقى واضح ممكن بننزل الابلكيشن على الموبايل وبنعمل شير سكرين من على الكمبيوتر عادي بس بنتكلم من الموبايل. طيب حاضر انا الزوم على الموبايل انا اشتغل على الموبايل كمان حالا يعني. هنعمل لحضرتك ميوت من على الكمبيوتر ونتكلم من صوت الموبايل. طيب حالا. كده سامعيني؟ أفضل؟ أنا واحدة عامل لحضرتك ميوت من هنا بس تمام تمام اتفضل حضرتك كده اتكلم دكتور عصام اتكلم دكتور عصام مفيش صوت يا دكتور عصام حضرتك كده اضغط على صوت المايك معلش أنا أنا عامل لحضرتك ميوت دلوقتي لحظة واحدة Can you hear me better now? Ah, quite. Is that clear? Okay. Doctor Asad, I'm sorry. 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 Through the anterior nostril, you actually go to the middle meatus. If you need to go to the inferior meatus, you have first to go downwards and then backwards again. And this is very important. People go into the nasal cavity and they try to search for the tube. This is wrong. This will cause injury to the nasal mucosa and bleeding. So you have to understand where you are inside the nose. The other issue is the floor of the nose. This is the floor of the nose, which is the palate. Below this floor of the nose, there is the mouth cavity. Let us measure the distance from the punctum till the end of the nasolacrimal duct. Two millimeter vertical, eight millimeter horizontal, that's 10. 10 body, 20, and 12. This is 32 millimeters. But this is in mature adults. In infants, in the first year, it's 50%. So you're talking about 16, maximum 20 millimeters from the punctum till the end of the nasolacrimal duct. Just look at the tip of your finger and see how long is 20 millimeters. It's half smaller than one inch, smaller than one phalanx. The distance is very short. What we usually do is that when we introduce a probe, the probes are long, too long, and they are designed long so that you can handle them easily. Not because you need the whole length of the probe. You actually need only two 
centimeters, 20 millimeters, until the age of one year. Maximum in adults, you need three centimeters. The probes are 15 and 20 centimeters. What people intend to do is that when they feel the obstruction, they push more. When you push more, you will reach the floor of the nose, the palate, and especially in children, it is very soft, you penetrate the palate. And the reports of, and I have seen myself several times when people call you because the probe is appearing in the nasal, in the mouse cavity, and you do injure the, the, the palate. So what I advise all of you is to calibrate your probes. Just even with a marking pen, put a caliber at one centimeter, at two centimeter, and three centimeter, and never push your probe more than this. Otherwise, you will lead to injury of the nasal cavity and of the palate. Don't push. What is congenital nasolacrimal duct obstruction? First, it is one of the very common congenital anomalies. We all know the classic type, which is, occurs in 85% of the cases where the obstruction is at the level of Hasner valve. But this is not all the cases. We have 15% of the types of obstruction where we call the atypical types. Don't, don't go through them. Here are the photos. Type A, a typical A, a typical B, a typical C, and a typical D. In all of this, there is no connection between the nasolacrimal duct and the nasal cavity. How can I differentiate between the most common Hasner valve obstruction, which is 85%, and the complicated or atypical cases? The common type is usually unilateral. If the child has bilateral obstruction, you should suspect it no atypical. If there is consanguinity between the father and the mother, you should suspect atypical. If there is history of the, his sisters and brothers, you should suspect atypical. If the symptoms are very severe, the patient is three months coming with a lot of discharge, bilateral, uh, massage is not working, using drops all the time, Severe symptoms is an indication that this might be atypical. If the child has done previous procedure, probably probing, and it's recurrent, we should suspect atypical. What is the difference? The difference is that the typical type, we all know, can improve, can resolve with massage, with antibiotics. You can wait for the treatment until nine months or one year. The atypical types will not. The atypical types, you have to interfere as early as possible in order to restore the patency. So you always look for clues if this is typical or atypical. Now, what, what to do for treatment? Between birth and six months, you teach the mother how to do proper massage, and then you give possibly antibiotic, weak antibiotic, like to Brex or to Bramycin, and try to avoid Digamox or uh, 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 fluorocholinurones. If after the age of six months, or if the mother is reliable and has been doing good massage for a month or two, and the, the kid is still not improving, then we now always advise early intervention. Why? Because we now know that around the six months, the success rate of probing is 92%, even more. After the six months, the success rate of probing declines, and there are some reports that it declines by 1% every week. So probing is an easy procedure. You can do it in the office. You can do it under general anesthesia if you want and the success rate is high. So if you want to do it, then do it at the time when the success rate is high. Some people repeat the probing 
two times if the first time fails. I don't repeat it, especially if I know that the, the, whoever did the first time is a good doctor, the good oculoplastic doctor. I will not repeat. After the age of 12 months, we try to add intubation to the probe. We'll talk about the stents later on. You all know the tubes, but we'll talk about the types later on. But with intubation, and since you are do, giving the child general anesthesia, we always add what we call infracture of the inferior turbinate. And let me go back to this drawing to understand what infracture means. This is the inferior turbinate. Where is the septum, the nasal septum? The nasal septum is not towards the eye. It's on the opposite side. Here is the nasal septum. So this is the midline. This is medially. The eye is lateral. What we try to do is we try to move this inferior turbinate away from the opening of the nasolacrimal duct. So we push it towards the nasal septum, towards the midline. So we call it infracture of the inferior turbinate. We go in with the periosteal elevator with the hemostate of artery, and we go under the inferior turbinate and we push it. And you will hear a click, kick. It will move towards the midline. This is called infracture of the inferior turbinate, and this allows better spacing for the nasolacrimal duct to drain. If until the age of two years, intubation and infracture fails, there is controversy. People, a lot of people would, would try to continue with this until three years and even four years to do intubation. The success rate of intubation becomes less by time. So we have what we call balloon dacryoplasty. And I will show you now the balloon and how it works. And the balloon dacryoplasty is a step to avoid DCR in children. There are several questions that we have to understand. All this applies for the typical type of nas congenital nasolacrimal left obstruction. For variants, this will not work. This was, for variants, you have to work earlier and you have to work using more uh, drastic procedures, more interference. In the variants, probing alone usually will fail. So if you know that this is one of the variants, so you, you do intubation earlier, you do probing earlier, you do balloon earlier. It's always earlier and more aggressive in va with variants. And let me show you now the balloon before we continue. What is the balloon? The balloon is exactly like the heart catheter. And actually, we, we, because it's expensive, we try to use heart catheters instead of uh, the, the, the balloon with the comp. Here is the balloon. You introduce the balloon inside the nasolacrimal duct. It comes with a probe, simple probe. You introduce it, and there is a mark. On the slide, I found the slide, Mish 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 Al Balloon, and then type out. Here is the balloon. This is the balloon. Nice. It's exactly like the probe, but in the middle of the probe, there is a deflated balloon. You go in, like here, it's the probe. Here is the balloon. At a special mark at the punctum, you stop. And then you use an inflation device to inflate the balloon from this size to this size. What the balloon will do is simple. Here is the deflated balloon. Here is the inflated balloon. And here is an X-ray where the balloon is inside the nasolacrimal duct. What is the advantage of the balloon? 
The main advantage of the balloon is that it is the only device that dilates the nasolacrimal duct in both meridian, both vertically and horizontally. All lacrimal probes and tubes work in one meridian, the vertical meridian. Only the balloon works in both meridian, vertically and horizontally. So it has a higher success rate. And we use the balloon as a step before DCR in children. I don't want to do a DCR with bone breakage in children. I try to avoid it. So I can use the balloon. The balloon is very easy. Uh, the main disadvantage is that it is expensive. The company that produces the balloon makes it single use. When you inflate it, like here, you cannot deflate it. You have to pull it from the nose and that's it. And you cannot deflate it again. So it's only single use. So it is expensive, but it's a very useful technique in cases of congenital nasolacrimal duct obstruction as a step before doing your DCR. Now I want to show you on video how to do proper massage. What is the idea of the massage? The idea of the massage is exactly what we do at our homes if we have obstruction in a sink. Do you know the device that we use to drain? The black uh, sponge with a handle? This is exactly massage. You have to do two steps for massage to work. First, you have to occlude, and then you induce pressure, and suddenly you remove the pressure. The negative pressure that will be released will try to open the obstructed duct. How can we do this? You get this, your small finger, the little finger of the mother. You press on the punctum and the canaliculus. You occlude, you need to press hard so that the punctum and the canaliculus are pressed between the finger and the bone. It's a bit painful. The child should not like it. If the child is not in pain, then you are not doing it right. <laughs> حضرتك بتعمل شير بس للفيديو تاني يعني بتعمل شير سكرين وبتختار الأيقونة بتاع الفيديو أنا مش عامل فيديو يا فندم أنا بوريها لايف على الفيديو بتاع حضرتك لا الفيديو مش ظاهر طب لا أنا ظاهر عندي طب نعيده تاني وزهره فوق يا دكتور دكتور عصام عارض ظاهر ظاهر عندي أنا بيشرح لايف هو هو بيشرح لايف إحنا شايفينه آه نعيده تاني يا بيه طب نعيد تاني يا دكتور عصام بعد نعيد تاني the idea is to occlude the system and then suddenly release the pressure. So you, you come with the little finger of the mother. معلش دكتور عصام ثانية واحدة دكتور عصام دكتور أحمد معلش اضغط على السكرين بتاع دكتور عصام عشان تبقى فول سكرين. خلاص كده اتفضل دكتور عصام. The idea is to occlude the system and then suddenly release the pressure. وده اللي بنعمله في الحمامات ولا في الاحواض عندنا لما بتتسد بالكاوتش السود يو هولد يور فينجر يو بريس اون ذا بانكتوم اند ذا كانيكولس اند يو بريس هارد تو اوكلود ذا بانكتوم اند ذا كانيكولس بتوين ذا فينجر اند ذا كارتيلاجينس بيس ات ذا ميديال كانسل اند اي وونت اول اوف يو تو دو ات رايت ناو ات هاز تو بي ا بيت بين خجل حاجه if the child is not feeling the pain, then it's not correct. You're not occluding correctly. And then you count one, two, three. During this count, you are occluding the system. You're creating a negative pre pressure inside the system. And then suddenly, quickly, you leave your pressure and guide this pressure down through the nose. It's not massage. Actually, it is not massage. I don't know who called it massage. It has nothing to do with massage. You do not do like this. It's not massage. 
it is pressing to occlude the system and then suddenly releasing the pressure and trying to direct the pressure with your finger to go down along the axis of the nasolacrimal valve. All what is needed is one correct uh, uh, pr uh, procedure and the valve will open. And sometimes what actually, when you try to train the mother at the clinic and you do it yourself with her for one or two times, you hear a click. This click means that the valve has opened and the patient has cured. Why do we ask mothers to do it 30 times per day or 50 times per day? Because we only want one of them to be done correctly. All what you need is one proper procedure. That's why if a mother comes to you and tell you, I've been doing massage for one month, for two months, and it's not working, it will never work. Don't think that after three months or after two months of massage, that this time it will work. If it doesn't work early, it will not work. Most of the time I ask mothers, to train them, ask them to do it properly for one week. Does it work? For one week, most probably it will not work again. This is congenital nasolacrimal duct obstruction, which is the common congenital anomaly in ophthalmology. Let's move on with the system. Let's talk about punctal stenosis. Again, why does punctal stenosis happen? There are so many reasons of punctal stenosis. You all know them. One of the reasons is, which I would like to stress very much, is what we call dacryotoxicity. What is dacryotoxicity? I want you to look to the nasolacrimal duct, especially the punctum canaliculus, the same way that nephrologists look to the kidneys. The kidney is accustomed to a certain solution with a certain pH, with a certain level of calcium, oxalate, potassium. If this changes, stones starts to happen in the kidney and the system becomes occluded. The same way occurs in the punctum and the canaliculus. The punctum and the canaliculus are accustomed to tears. Tears that have special pH, that has special concentration of solutes, of glucose. When this tears changes, the punctum and the canalicular epithelium gets edematous, healed by fibrosis, and get obstructed. And the single most common cause of tear changes is the use of eye drops. Eye drops are a major reason for punctal stenosis and obstruction. And we call this dacryotoxicity. You all know that eye drops are harmful to the corneal epithelium. And we call this epitheliopathy, epithelial toxicity. The same for the punctum and the canaliculus. We call this dacryotoxicity. Which drops? All types of drops. Any chronic uh, use uh, of Dr. Asam. screen share screen or not? And I'm share screen if I'm حاضر يا فندم.
السلايد مش باينه يا دكتور مش باين البرزنتيشن السلايد مش باين لغايه دلوقتي تمام كده دكتور طيب حاجه بس نعملها إيه سلايد نكبرها بس وخلاص يبقى ده كريوتوكسيسيتي از ذا افكت chronic use of artificial tears on the punctum and the canalicular epithelium that results in punctal stenosis. And this is a very famous occurrence. Let's say patient does cataract surgery and he's prescribed drops. He's doing well, but he comes for the follow-up after two or three, or three weeks complaining of tearing, that the eye is tearing. The surgeon is usually afraid of uh, uveitis, iritis, complications. So he increases the drops, particularly the steroids. And this results in more injury to the punctum and canalicular epithelium. And this results in more obstruction. So we have several types of punctal stenosis. The toxic punctal stenosis. Here, for example, this is the toxic punctal stenosis where the punctum is uh, edematous. Then we have the fibrous, the fibrosis, the cicatricial punctal stenosis, let's say like trachoma, like uh, uh, injuries, chemical burns, ocular cicatricial perfigoid. And then both will end in the same is complete obliteration of the punctum. How do we treat punctal stenosis? First, there are grading of punctal stenosis. You can all read this in the books. Okay, this is for exams and... But how to diagnose? Fluorescein dye disappearance, slit lamp examination, dilatation of the punctum, and probing and only till the canaliculus. Why? Because punctal stenosis spreads through the canaliculus. So the more you wait, the more a whole length of the canaliculus becomes obstructed as well. So you want to understand if the leveling, if it is only punctum or it's punctum plus vertical canaliculus or punctum plus horizontal canaliculus and how many millimeter of the canaliculus. So you only probe until the length of the canalicus. And then we do syringing. And I want to, to stop to see how do we properly do syringing to diagnose obstruction. First of all, we use a wide bore needle, a syringe. You don't want to use very narrow cannulas. Why? Normal tears go through the system without pressure. When you use a very narrow syringe, particularly a cannula, particularly if you use a big syringe, you are actually doing this under very high pressure, which is not the right way. It can give you false positive. It can show that the uh, saline has went through the nose, but normal tears will not go. So what we do is we use the smallest syringe, an insulin syringe, with a wide bore cannula, so that the pressure is not high. And you, with your finger, you don't really press hard. It is the pressure of, your, of my finger that I now know how much is this obstruct. I have to be very gentle. I don't push under pressure. If the saline has to go under pressure, this is false positive. Normal tears will not go under pressure. So syringing, you only stop at the opening of the punctum, wide bore cannula, smallest syringe needed. And this will show you where, if the nasolacrimal duct is obstructed as well or not, because there is difference between just punctum punctum plus part of the canaliculus, punctum plus whole canaliculus, and nasolacrimal duct. And we will thus discuss this later. 
How do we treat punctal stenosis? The first thing to do in treatment of punctal stenosis is to ask the patient to stop using any drops whatsoever for one week. Give time for the punctal epithelium to relax and the edema to subside. The first few days will be bad on the patient and you have to explain to him, stop drops for one week. The first two days, usually tearing will increase. But later on, more than 60 to 70% will improve by just stopping using any eye drop. Then after one week, you prepare topical preservative free steroids and ask the patient to use them as an anti-inflammatory for the punctal epithelium. I want to say that one of the main reasons of punctal stenosis with the use of drops is the presence of preservatives in the drops. Also, the steroid drops are suspension. That's why we usually ask patients to uh, steer them before applying in, in the eye. These suspensions, the particles in the suspension act like needles and will cause more inflammation. Again, like in the kidney, how does stones form in the kidney? So first thing, stop all drops for one week. Second, start after one week, use topical preservative free steroids twice per day. Just with this regime, 50 to 70% will improve. The other option is to do perforated punctal plugs. These are plugs that has opening and we'll discuss them later with the other types of lacrimal stents in five minutes. The problem with the plugs is that they are a bit expensive and if the patient drops his, his lid hardly, they can extrude. This is a perforated punctal plug. It's a normal plug with a hole in the center. It looks actually like a ring. The perforated punctal plugs work as a ring that dilates the, the wall of the punctum but has a central lumen which allows tears in. The other option is the mini monoca stent. And we'll show it later. With... And then we have the self-retaining stent. What are the self-retaining stents? They are regular tubes. But at the end of the silicon end, it has two wings, flanges. When you insert them through the punctum, the flanges are on the side of the tube. Until you go in and you pass by end the canaliculus and go into the sac, the flanges will stretch and the tube will be self-returning. These are called the bicanalicular self-retaining intubation. And they work well in punctal and canalicular stenosis. It's an office procedure. The patient does not need to go into the operating room. You don't have to do any incisions. It will need some training in the beginning, but it works in most cases. It works well. You introduce it like any uh, dilator, like any intubation through the punctum and canaliculus going gently. The flanges are on the side of the silicon part. When you go inside and you become inside the uh, sac cavity, the flanges will stretch, fly, and they will prevent this tube from coming out. So this is the bicanalicular uh, self-retaining. The last procedure is the classic procedure, the SNP procedures for punctal occlusion. Uh, we have several types of SNP. There is one SNP, there is triangular two SNPs, 
and there is rectangular three SNPs. One SNP punctoplasty usually fails. Has very, it's very short because it's easy that the fibrosis will occlude the one SNP. The traditional three SNP is a triangle. You do one SNP vertical, one SNP vertical, and you connect them horizontally. The better three SNP is the rectangle. You do one SNP on one side, the other SNP on the other side, and then you connect them. And this has the best success rate is the rectangular SNP, the three SNP rectangular punctoplasty, and it works in 85% success rate. There is one punch, like the glaucoma punch. There is a punch that you introduce inside the punctum, and the punch will remove parts of the vertical and horizontal canaliculus. This is called as wedge punctoplasty. If you have the machine, the, the, the punch, it's again, it has good success rate. The last option is when the upper part of the canaliculus is occluded with the punctum, you do retrograde transcanalicular punctoplasty. It's exactly what general surgeons do for intestinal obstruction. You will go from the back. You will open on the middle of the canaliculus, and then you will bypass a hard uh, uh, instrument like a trefine, I will show you right now, and you come out through the pump. It's a difficult procedure. It has the highest success rate because you will insert a big stent and you will suture the end. However, all what we need to know about bump to plasty for the general ophthalmologist is dacryotoxicity. Please stop using drops all the time because drops are the major enemy of the punctal epithelium and are the main reason for punctal occlusion. This now will take us to stents. I want to speak with you about lacrimal stents. We have mentioned several of them, but now we need to talk generally about stents. Who called them tubes? Most stents are actually not tubes. Most stents are stents. They are they have no human. They are not tubes. The aim of the stents is to maintain the opening of the walls. The aim of the stent is not to work as tubes to drain. We have several types of lacrimal stents. So uh, let me remind you, we have said now that there are two words that are used incorrectly in the lacrimal system. One word is massage. It's actually not massage. The other word is tubes. They are actually not tubes. They are not hollow. They are solid. Tears cannot grow th to go through them. We have the punctal plugs. And strangely enough, you all know the punctal plugs. Punctal plugs are used for dry eyes and for epiphora. They are used for dry eyes to occlude the punctal. And they can have different sizes, small, medium, or large. And some companies have them in 0.4 millimeter, 0.5, 6, 7, or 8. They have different duration. We have temporary puncture plugs that, that last for one week. And these are made for collagen. And these are used as a test to know what will happen if, before you insert the main plug, the permanent plug. And you have plugs that work for six months and then dissolve. And then you have the permanent plugs that are usually made of silicon or PMMA. Plugs can be inserted in different positions. 
Some plugs, most of them are on the punctum, some of them are intracanalicular. Then we have plugs that work for epiphora. We call them the flow controller or the perforated punctal plugs. And we just mentioned them as one of the lines of treatment of punctal occlusion, is to insert a perforated punctal plug. The other type of tube is what you all know is the bicanalicular intubation system. These are the classic tubes. And I just want to ask you, let's talk about a child with congenital nasolacrimal duct obstruction. And I want to open the Hasner valve at the end of the nasolacrimal duct. Can I go through the upper punctum or can I go through the lower punctum? I can go through either the upper, I will reach, or the lower, I will still reach the Hasner valve. Why do I have to do from both upper and lower? This means more procedure, more anesthesia, double the time. Why were the tubes bicanalicular? The problem is if you do monocanalicular, you will have one end in the nose, one end in the punctum. How will you fixate the end in the punctum? For years, we had no way of fixing the upper end of the tube if it is monocanalicular. So we had to make it bicanalicular so that the, there is this, a small piece of the tube that you will see like the letter C between both puncta. We used bicanalicular because we failed to fix the upper end of the monocanalicular tube. We don't need bicanalicular at all. We can work through only one canaliculus. And this is the classic, the bicanalicular. When we improved, when we used plugs for a long time, we invented the monocanalicular tubes. What are the monocanalicular tubes? It's one limb of the bicanalicular tube, but the end is a plug. So you do your procedure, you do your intubation, and instead of doing it from upper and lower punctai, you do it from just one of them. And at the end, the upper end of the silicon tube is like a plug that will become fixated in the punct. And I want to ask you, which is larger? Is the plug larger than the punctum or the punctum larger than the plug? The plug must be larger than the punctum. So how, how do we insert it in the punctum if it is larger than the punctum? It's the same way if what we, you do with your shirt. Mean at Akbar, is Zurar or Al Irwa? Is Zurar Lazimi by Akbar min Al Irwa? Is they type low Zurar Akbar, Wella, Hayflit? Is they Zurar Akbar, will Rakibu go Al Irwa, Al Irwa? Lazim Rakibu ala Sefu. Is Zurar Ashan Yerkab, Lazim Al Awal, it hat ala Sefu, Ashan Yedar Yetkul, and Owa larger than the punk. The same with the plug. The plug is larger than the punctum. And to introduce it, you have to, to introduce it obliquely. And then you rotate it. All plugs will come with special inserters that will do the same. You introduce it obliquely because it is larger. And this is the issue of the plugs and of the monocanalicular tubes. So we discussed, as you remember, we discussed the plugs, we discussed the classic bicanalicular tube and the monocanalicular tubes. And again, they are not tubes and how to insert the monocanalicular or and how to insert the punctal plugs. Do we have other types of stents? Yes, we have the classical, the monocanalicular, which is long, 
starts from the punctum and ends in the nasolacrimal duct. We have one monocanalicular that is only fit for the canaliculus. We call it mini monoca. The mini monoca is a monocanalicular tube that is short. It only applies to the canaliculus. What's the main use? The main use is in canalicular injuries or canalicular obstruction. And we will discuss canalicular obstruction shortly. Another type of stents that I want to show you is the lacrimal trephines. What is a lacrimal trephine? A lacrimal trephine is a, a stent, a, a, a lacrimal instrument that we use in cases of canalicular obstruction to open and to remove the obstructed segment. How does it work? I will show it to you on the video if uh, possible. This is the lacrimal trephine. If you see, it looks like a probe. You hold it from here, you go in, in the pattern like a probe. Hazy, Dr. Hassan. Is it clear or not? No, Hazy, we're seeing it, but we're not seeing it. We're not seeing it, Hazy. Tell me the video, I'm going to put the camera. والفيديو دلوقتي ظاهر عشان فول سكرين اهو طب شايفين شاي... انا مش انا مش شايفه اقفل انت عشان اقدر اشوف Let me explain Do you know how Egyptians do stuffed uh, vegetables For example kosa The instrument that is used This is the lacrimal trephine It is it consists of two parts a blunt part that is actually like a normal uh, lacrimal probe. And you introduce it through the punctum, you go in slowly until you reach the level of the obstruction. When you reach the level of the obstruction, you remove the blunt part. I'm now removing the blunt part, keeping the sharp part inside, and you rotate it exactly the same way that our mothers used to do stuffed uh, food. Move slowly, rotation. It will go through the obstructed part until it takes, it cuts all the obstruction until you reach another uh, patent part. You take it out you will find the core of the obstruction inside this lacrimal trephine. And this is a classic way, a very useful way in treating canalicular obstruction. We will now probably talk about canalicular obstruction and uh, Dr. Ramos will tell us about different ways of dealing with canalicular obstruction, but lacrimal trephine is a, a very good procedure for canalicular obstruction that works in 60% of the cases. By the way, canalicular obstruction is the most difficult thing to do to work in uh, uh, the lacrimal system. The last thing that I want to talk about the stents is what you will hear about the rattling system of stents. What is the rattling system of stents? This system has been uh, in the market maybe for 15 years now. Uh, at the beginning, there, it was very popular. Now it's almost not popular. The rattling system is the system that people who do not know how to work on the lacrimal system want to use. Instead of studying the nasal anatomy, they decided that it is easier that my 
tube consists of a regular tube to which 50 centimeters, half a meter of proline suture, blue proline suture is attached so that when you start intubation from above, you don't go into the nose to look for the probe or the tube. You just keep threading the proline suture until the half meter of proline starts to appear at the nasal cavity and then you pull it, it will bring the silicon tube with it. So the rattling system is a, a system that looks like the normal silicon intubation, but attached to it is 50 centimeter of proline. It has a special probe. You, you do not do uh, the probing with the regular probe. You do it with the rattling probe. The rattling probe is exactly like the regular probe but has a very small slit on the back that through which this slit, you will pull the proline suture. In my understanding, rarely it is used now. You, you might be asked about it. You might read about it in some of the books, but it's no more used. John's tube, Dr. Ramis will talk about it very shortly, and balloons, we've talked about it. So lacrimal stents, they are stents, they are not tubes. They start by plugs, whether closed plugs for dry eyes, open plugs for epiphora, uh, permanent plugs, temporary plugs. Then we go into the... Tubes find... Uh, the rattling system. These are uh, the types of lacrimal stents. Before I leave uh, you uh, with Dr. Ramos, I would just like to discuss the starting of the canalicular obstruction. And uh, canalicular obstruction is the single most difficult part in the lacrimal system. There's different levels of obstruction of the canalicular uh, uh, canaliculi near the punctum in the middle or near the common canaliculus. This is again, we discussed the monocanalicular and the mini monica and how to introduce it. This is very beneficial in canalicular injuries or canalicular obstruction. How to treat canalicular obstruction? We discussed the lacrimal trephines. We discussed the microscopic uh, canaliculoplasty, the same way the general surgeons treat intestinal obstruction. You go in with the microscope, you remove the obstructed part, and you resuture under the microscope the patent parts. We discussed the mini monica tubes. Metello tube is hardly used. Dr. Ramos will now discuss the John's tube. And the last thing that I want to, to talk about in canalicular obstruction is Botox. Botox in the lacrimal system? Yes. Why do we use Botox in the lacrimal system, particularly in canalicular obstruction? You all know that Botox works by, as an anticholine, acetylcholine. So shortly, we all know that lacrimal secretion is mediated by the parasympathetic, so by acetylcholine. So if you inject Botox in the lacrimal gland, this will reduce lacrimal secretion. Do we need to reduce uh, lacrimal secretion? Do we have diseases that we don't want tears to be produced? Yes. We have three major diseases that we don't want tears to be, re, be produced. One of them, you all know, it's called crocodile tear syndrome, which is apparent regeneration of the facial nerve. After facial palsy, uh, there is misconnection between the salivary gland and the lacrimal gland. So when the patient starts to eat, the salivary gland uh, secretes and he cries while eating like the crocodile who cries while eating. 
So it's called crocodile tear syndrome or, or gustatory epiphora. Uh, in the past, we used to treat this by removing sometimes the lacrimal gland or cutting its nerve. Now we, we treat this by injecting Botox in the lacrimal gland. This will reduce the secretion. Primary hyper. Again, if you remember the anatomy of the parasympathetic supply, you will know that the parasympathetic comes from the uh, greater superficial petrosal, the vidian nerve, the connection, the nerve mo uh, slides on the uh, surface of the petrous bone. People who have car accidents and motorcycle accidents develop fracture of the base of the skull. What is the base of the skull? Simply, if you have a skull and you remove the vault, what you see inside is the base of the skull. And the base of the skull is mainly two bones, sphenoid with petrous. Fracture of the petrous bone healed by callus formation. This callus formation can irritate the vidian nerve, the parasympathetic nerve that goes to the uh, para, uh, left gland and will result in what we call primary hypersecretion. Unless you are uh, uh, work oculoplasty a lot, you will not see cases of primary hypersecretion. Uh, they usually die from the fracture and from the accident, but if they live, they will have primary hypersecretion. The treatment for this is Botox injection in the lacrimal gland. Because of this use of Botox, we decided to say, okay, if I have canalicular obstruction, and the patient has epiphyl. And canalicular obstruction treatment is difficult, whether be lacrimal trifine, be mini monica, be microscopic, be John's tube. Why don't I inject Botox in the lacrimal gland to reduce lacrimal secretion? It reduces lacrimal secretion by 50%. So the patient will not develop dry eyes. So nowadays, Botox is used by so many people including myself, as a treatment for canalicular obstruction by reducing the secretion of the lacrimal gland. And the, there is a lot of studies now about this use for Botox. Uh, thank you so much for, for your time. Uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Ramis Chokri. Dr. Ramis is uh, one of the pioneers of oculoplasty in Egypt, uh, working in Al Watani Hospital, previously in Al Maghrabi Hospital, and uh, he will discuss uh, uh, some methods of diagnosis of the lacrimal system. Uh, then he will proceed to uh, John's tube and CDCR, and then when he finishes, uh, I will come back and we'll discuss together DCR step by step. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Assam. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tari, for uh, inviting me. Uh, you can hear me good? Yes, uh, I will discuss uh, one of the topics, and we need all to know it, is the canalicular um, obstruction of fibrosis, uh, what's called by uh, CDCR, or conjunctival dacryocyst rhinostomy. Of uh, course, Dr. can give us a hint about all the canalicular obstruction, from the first punctal stenosis to the nasolacrimal obstruction, and of course, we'll have a discussion about DCR. And I will discuss this issue. It's very common, and we see it in our clinic, so uh, we have to, to, to have a quick uh, review of uh, the, lac the tear drainage system. We all know that the lacrimal gland secretes uh, tears and then to the, the passes to, through the tear meniscus to the upper and lower canaliculus to the nasolacrimal duct. Dr. Assam, whatever Dr. Assam said now, that uh, the lacrimal system is like a drainage system, like uh, the type and drainage system. Uh, first of all, we have to uh, know what's the difference between true epiphora and wet eye. I, uh, any patient with lacrimation, uh, we have to exclude first myobomunitis and anterior blepharitis before 
uh, the, the diagnosing the patient as a nasolacrimal obstruction. Uh, once we treat myelomonitis and anterior blepharitis and we exclude nasolacrimal obstruction, the patient treating will, will, will improve and the condition will be better for him. Uh, true epiphora uh, this, uh, is uh, usually uh, uh, diagnosed by history and by lacrimal drainage evaluation. History, simply we have to ask the patient about some issues like duration of lacrimation, unilateral or bilateral, frequency, he's taking drugs, glaucoma, uh, history of any recurrent uh, swelling like necrocytitis, history of allergy, dry eye, uh, or exposure to irritant smokes, and history of sinus surgery is very important. Also, we have to discuss with the patient or ask the patient uh, the, the history of trauma to the face, nasal bone fractures or nasal bleeding. It's very common to have a patient with nasal lacrimal obstruction post trauma to the face. Uh, to diagnose nasal lacrimal obstruction, uh, I have, and we, we have three tests, uh, three procedures. We do it like um, the fluorescein dye disappearance test. The lacrimal syringing and nasal endoscopy. The fluorescein dye disappearance test, we I don't rely on it much, but we put one drop of fluorescein in the lower fornix and then wait for five minutes and check the dye. If it's uh, it's not there, uh, there it's a normal drainage. If it's there, it can, it is partial or complete obstruction. Actually, this is a, a crude way of the of uh, um, diagnosing lacrimal uh, obstruction. What I use in my clinic and in my work is the syringing. As we discussed, we have used a cannula with a very slow, with a very slow flow. I used, I usually like this type of cannula, which is 11 millimeter long. That the, this is the length of the canaliculus, so it's not painful to the patient. I dilate the punctai. I usually uh, use um, uh, fluids like uh, fluids not irritant to the patient, like water or uh, contact lens solution. If we use a normal sign. The patient may vomit or may feel it in his throat or mouth uh, and cause uh, nausea and vomiting. First, so uh, we discussed about the dye disappearance test. Second, the lacrimal drainage system or lacrimal syringing. And we, when, you, when we do lacrimal syringing, we have to know that it uh, gives us some data. Not only I, I do syringing and uh, diagnose the patient has nasolacrimal obstruction, Actually, uh, uh, when, I, when I use the, the cannula as a probe during uh, irrigation, I get a, a, a many um, data from the uh, syringing system. Uh, first of all, when I do a syringing, like the first picture here, this is from the American Academy, uh, and the, the influx of fluid come from the same canalicular, so it is canalicular obstruction. Uh, if it comes after from the upper, Canaliculus fast. This is a common canalicular obstruction. If it's after come, the fluid comes after uh, a delay, so it's a nasolacrimal obstruction. If I discuss with the patient uh, that uh, the amount of fluid coming in the nose is it's less on one side, so it's a partial obstruction, or the whole fluid comes through the nasolacrimal system. So, doing syringing, we can get some data about the site of obstruction. Type. Uh, we, shall we uh, shall we think about uh, doing uh, a, a patient going for with, with lacrimation to us is having a nasolacrimal obstruction? This nasolacrimal obstruction needs tachycystectomy or DCR or CDCR. I'm discussing this with, because of this picture of this patient I had a long time ago. She has a very large tachycystocele. Actually, when I did her, I did her STT, it's at the same size as the, as the globe, uh, it's very big. Actually, I was not able to examine the canaliculus or the puncta. I was suspecting a lacrimal uh, gland tumor, but, but actually lacrimal, lacrimal gland tumor is very rare in, uh, in, in, in patients with this size of swelling. So I went for doing a DCR and uh, successfully I found uh, upper and lower canaliculus, it's patent and I put her a silicon tube uh, and it went so fine, and the patient uh, removed the tube after three months. So first of all, we, ha we have to discuss with the patient the, the, the different regimen of doing the surgery, what's the benefits, and if the patient is going to uh, accept uh, do, the, the, the type of tube he's going uh, to, to, be, uh, to, to, to be offered for his uh, obstruction.
Nasal endoscopy is very important preoperatively and postoperatively preoperatively to, this, to, to check the, the opening of the nasal lacrimal duct under the inferior turbinate, if there is a deviated septum, nasal polyps, allergy, atrophic rhinitis. It's very important before doing any DCR. Postoperatively, detect the site of DCR ostium and check the Lister Jones tube. And it's very important for follow up to examine the patient endoscopically. Or if you don't use an endoscope, you can send him for an ENT specialized in visualizing the nose by endoscope. Uh, canalicular obstruction can, can, can be caused by involution. The, the main causes of canalicular obstruction is involutional, post traumatic infection by different types of chlamydia, aspergillus, actinomyces. Uh, the most common cause of uh, canalicular obstruction is Stephen Johnson syndrome, ocular secretion pyphigoid. And we, we see these cases so many in our uh, country and Middle East, especially in Egypt and Middle East. So we have to discuss with the patient the method of treatment. And also there are other uh, most common types of calliculitis uh, causing nasolacrimal obstruction. Calliculitis is one, one of the most common causes of canalicular obstruction and discharge and, and it causes lacrimal obstruction and canalicular obstruction. Preoperatively, we have to assess the patient, as I, as I said before, for, with an ENT consultant to assess endoscopically the nose and to check if there is any deviated septum, nasal polyp. Before going for DCR, the patient uh, had to stop bleed, to stop any bleeding tissue and any bleeding sorry uh, bleeding uh, treatment like warfarin, palp, plavix, and he has to check the, his bleeding profile, and blood pressure, sugar level, and to stop aspirin for ten days to prevent postoperative bleeding. We can do a DCR under general anesthesia and local anesthesia. Uh, there are some doctors uh, have, uh, maybe they don't don't like doing DCR under local, but actually to my experience, I've done a lot of DCR under local and it is accepted by the patient according to their uh, uh, acceptability of accepting doing DCR under local or not. Some patients have medical conditions which cannot be uh, accepted or will not be by, accepted by the anesthesiologist to do a DCR under general, so we can do under local. Uh, I will discuss it with you now, how to, to give a local anesthesia um, uh, for a patient. Usually, we, 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 the injection site is infratrochlear at the lacrimal crest, incisional site subcutaneously, and deep pre sub preosteal. Also, I like to do um, uh, anesthesia. I'll give anesthesia to the nasal mucosa, the lateral nasal wall, through a 30-gauge needle. When they have a wait for 10, 15 minutes. So the infratrochlear, so the, in, the lacrimal crests, and at the incisional site. This is the site where we inject the local anesthesia. Uh, indication for DCR uh, are so many, but for CDCR, we have to uh, discuss what's the most uh, common um, uh, obstruction in this kind of patients. So uh, patients with canalicular uh, obstruction less than eight millimeter, this is uh, very common, and this can be diagnosed by syringing. Uh, other, co other causes of canalicular obstruction is iatrogenic trauma by probing and intubation for adult patients. I have seen many patients have done intubation and probing at the, uh, at the, adult, at, at the adult age, uh, causing trauma and fibrosis of the canalicus. Where well, one of the most common co uh, indications for CDCR is lacrimal pump dysfunction, like facial palsy. Uh, as we all know, uh, Lister Jones tubes, uh, it's a Pyrex tube. So please, when you handle the Pyrex tube or the Lister Jones tube, handle it with a blunt forceps. Never use a toothed forceps. Toothed forceps can, can break it easily while handling it. A range of the tube from 15 to 21 millimeter, the length. Uh, you have to keep in your set uh, all the sizes, uh, one pair from each size, from 15 to 21. Uh, so when we use it, uh, you can have an, ex an extra amount of tubes. You can do a bilateral CDCR in one session. So you have to keep two uh, tubes in the, uh, from each length. The external flange of the tube uh, range from 3, 3.5, 4, 4.5, according to uh, the size of the cruncle, according to the size of the, uh, of the uh, uh, 
tube you are going to introduce from this patient. You have to check the size and you have to, uh, to use nasal endoscope or direct visualization by nasal, spe by nasal spe speculum uh, to check that tube it is away from the nasal septum. It has to be minimum two millimeter from the nasal septum. It can be tolerated for decades. A uh, patient can, be, ca can live with it, no problem. But usually patient, you ask him to, uh, to, to put three drops daily and to use a nasal watch to avoid discharges from uh, 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 closing the tube from the nasal side. These are the different types of lifted Jones tubes. On the left, on the right side, we have two types. This is the called the angled non Jones tube, and this is the frost Jones tube. Uh, this is an old tube used before from around the, two decades. Uh, and all these sizes, all these types of tubes and sizes of these tubes aimed to prevent dislodgement of the tube or extrusion of the tube after implantation for in these patients. It's angled here to prevent dislodgement. It's, uh, this is the one, the angled Jones tube. This is the frosted Jones tube. The frosted Jones tube is it's a, it's a Pyrex tube, Jones tube, coated with uh, mid pore. Uh, both tubes does not have a, a good success rate, especially the frosted Jones tube because it's very hard to remove it and it can be broken. So I don't recommend to use it. On the left side, we have the newest types, the stopless Jones tube, the Putterman double Jones tube, and the one I, I would like to, I would, I am, I'd like to recommend it to you and I'm using it, the suture hole Jones tube. Suture hole Jones tube, this is a simply a Jones tube with a small hole. It can be fixed a suture in it, non-absorbable suture. It's very tolerated by the patients, tolerable and has no little complication and less extrusion. One of the famous tubes now used is the stopless Jones tubes. It has a silicon ends to prevent dislodgement of the tube. And I used it before, it's very good and available in Egypt through the FCI company. The Putterman uh, Jones tube, I, I never use it, but it has uh, many complications because it's very hard to introduce it through your opening because it has two levels and when you push it, it may be broken during introduction. So these are the different types. What I recommend is the Jones tube with suture hole. Okay, uh, this is, uh, we have to, to buy or to have this set of uh, tray. This is an autoclavable tray, uh, have many uh, spaces for different types of tubes. There is here is the scale for measuring the uh, Lister Jones tube, the, the color and the length. And we have this uh, dilator, this is a gold, Jones gold dilators. This is a classic old way of introducing Lister Jones tubes. And I will show the latest one, which is different than this type. But this, uh, this gold uh, dilator, the Jones gold dilator has different diameters. You introduce it at the crunkle of the, of the lacrimal crunkle when you when you do a classic DCR, then you put your, you make an opening, and through this opening, you start pushing the dilators one by the other till we get the biggest size, this one, and then you introduce the Jones tube. So this tray is mandatory. You're doing DCR, you have to be autoclaved. I, I usually like to sterilize it by, plas by plasma to prevent uh, break breaking of these uh, tubes by um, high heat temperature. So you put the Jones tubes here, the, the dilators, and the scale is very important uh, during surgery. I will show it in the video how you can use this scale and you have to measure the tube before introduction, introducing it in the lacrimal system. Simply, we, uh, we, we put the tube, the Jones tube, after doing a classic DCR, uh, bone osteotomy, uh, making a nasal flap and a, a, a sac mucosal flap and ready to introduce the tube. Uh, the best site for Jones tube in, uh, position is the center of the lacrimal crunk. There are many studies saying that you have to remove part of the crunkle uh, and introduce it below the, the crunkle. I've, I've tried many uh, procedures. The best procedure is to save the crunkle. Please don't remove any part of it. Just stab it the center of the crunkle and introduce your Jones tube in the center. It's, it's 
very good to be centralized, protected by the cronkle, and prevent migration of the tube. When you put it in any place below or above, it will be migrated and you cannot get a good result and the patient cannot tolerate this type of tubes. So after introducing it, after, uh, uh, sorry, after you, you, you open the cronkle and you dilate it with the sharp, uh, in, with the sharp uh, von Graves, uh, uh, blunt, uh, sharp von, von Graves knife, you after that introduce the gold in the dilator and then you introduce the, jo the, the Dister Jones tube guided by the Bounds tube. This is the old classic way of introducing Lister Jones tube. The latest one is the FKI uh, introduced uh, introduction introducer set. This is a, a plastic dummy, uh, Lister Jones tube, with um, a, a wire tube, guide wire tube, with a sharp end and a blunt end. And uh, uh, the end cap, this, this end cap is to push this wire, guide wire in the crunker. And this is dilator, you, you move it through this guide wire. This is a very, very useful set. I do recommend to use it. it, it can, you, you can introduce the Lister Jones tube in less than 10 minutes. Uh, and you can use these dummies to, dissect, to, to check the level of the, of the Jones tube and the size and the length and the flange uh, by seeing these um, uh, rings inside the nose. And you can check the, the, tall, the, the length and the tallness of this tube by uh, endoscope. And it's very safe, and to be and avoid using many Lister Jones tubes, the original ones which can be broken during surgery. So simply, you introduce the guide wire in the crunkle. Uh, it has to be uh, in the crunkle and to to be introduced below the common canaliculus. After introducing it, you put the dummy uh, Jones tube. It's plastic or made of uh, of uh, autoclavable material. Uh, backwards, uh, you put it backwards to check the flange of the uh, Jones tube that you're going to implant in this patient. After that, you keep the wire as it is, as it is and then you put the introducer. It has a, it has a small end and a big end, or uh, uh, the, the small end to be put first and push it through the wire, followed by the large end. The large end push it and keeping the wire in the same place. By this we, we, we made a good hole in the crunkle so we can push after that the dummy and like this. After pushing the dummy in the crunkle we check it from the nose and when we see it from our endoscope we see these rings. These rings can give us a clue what is the length of the Lister Jones tube that I'm going to introduce. It. Always keeping in mind that the the tube must not touch the nasal septum, and there is a two millimeter uh, distance between the Jones tube and the uh, nasal septum. Otherwise, it will be uh, closed by discharge, it will bleed, and the patient will not tolerate it, and it will be painful. After knowing the exact length, I put it on the scale of the Jones tube, knowing the size of the tube, the, the flange, I have to check it, and the length. By checking the lens and the flange, I put the tube in the crunkle and it will be tolerated and the patient will, will, will not feel any pain after introducing this tube. As we can see in this picture on this slide, that the Jones tube or the dummy tube is away from the nasal septum at, at least two millimeter between the Jones tube and the nasal septum. And the tube is then after that pushed in the crunkle and uh, sutured by non-absorbable suture. The video demonstrates the, the operation after dissecting the lacrimal sac from the lacrimal fossa, bone, uh, bone nibbling by bone jars, and then formation of nasomucosal flap and sac flap. I start uh, here in this video, I am using the classic old ones before using the FCI uh, producer set. We push in the crunkle. We can use a dilator or a sharp instrument, and then we we reach the common canaliculus. Then we put the wise goldman, gold, the wise gold true, gold dilator, followed by the bigger sizes till I, I put the largest size of the 
a, a, a gold trooper. Then I introduced a Bowman's probe and check the length of the tube. Empirically, then I go to the scale and measure the, the Lester Jones tube, check the flange size carefully, and then I load it in the uh, Bowman's probe. So I can push the Bowman's probe first, then slide the Jones tube to be fitted inside the middle of the crumb. As you can see, I'm using the ring forceps, not the tooth forceps, blunt forceps, not so as not to traumatize or to break, to break the joints. Tube. After checking that it's behind the uh, the, 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 the flaps, I have to check the patency by syringing and check that the tube is patent. Then I fixate the joints tube. The one I'm using is the suture hole Jones tube with the non-absorbable. I would like to use, a sil um, sorry, this is in this video I'm using the proline and I can use also the silk suture, five, 600 silk suture. After passing the, the, the suture in the, in the hole and then uh, at the edge of the uh, crunkle, I fix the tube, I check it's fixed in place and then close the uh, flaps, the knees and mucosa flaps, and then the skin and muscle to be closed. Post-operatively, I check the tube. Regularly, I check the patient every uh, one week, and every three, six months, and I see the patient after one week. I recommend uh, prescribing the patient for life, lubricant eye drops and nasal wash. Lubricant eye drops to keep the fluids moving through the tube to avoid uh, tube uh, uh, blockage and nasal wash to prevent uh, blockage of the tube by nasal discharge. I remove the skin sutures, I mean skin sutures of the DCR and not the suture hole. I keep the suture hole unless it's not complicated or causing any granuloma. Cleaning the tube, patient can, 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 be clean, can, can by himself clean the tube or can come to your clinic and clean it every six, 12 months. Advise the patient not to blow his nose Otherwise, he would feel the, uh, air in the, the nose, air, sorry, air in the eye, and it may, may discharge some discharge. Uh, always keep ask the patient to press on the top of the tube and close his eyes to prevent any nasal discharge inside the tube. Tube extrusion and surgical emphysema can occur during the first two weeks after surgery. I usually follow up the patient. I check the tube in place. I check endoscopically the tube in place and check it's not uh, in touch of, with the nasal septum. It's very important. There is a, a two millimeter space or more. The tube is functioning and there's no discharge in the tube or around the tube. And always keep the patient under nasal cleaning. I, I usually recommend nasal, uh, nasal wash all the time, three times a day. Other complications we all face uh, from Lister Jones tube, the obstruction by mucus, migration or extrusion of the tube, Sometimes the patient cannot tolerate it. Uh, we have to know what where is the cause. I have to send him for an ENT surgeon to check if there's any nasal pathology. There, sometimes there is a reaction and pyogenic granuloma can happen with using some types of sutures. I have to remove these granulomas and re-suture it later on. Less common infection, discomfort, diplopia, and corneal abrasion if the tube is in touch with the, with the, with the cornea. The reflux of intranasal discretions, discharge, it's very common if the patient is not instructed to close the tube before nasal blow. Of course, uh, air, air inside the eye or air in the, in the eye from, from the patient, from patients blowing his nose can cause a dry eye. It's one of the causes of dry eye in these patients. I usually ask the patient that this tube will be in its place for life. He has to accept it, to live with it. All my patients uh, accepting it, no problem. Few of them uh, maybe have some complications, but I have to follow the complications concerning excessive nasal discharge, excessive, uh, excessive uh, 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 discharges closing the tube from the, from the side of the eye or from the upper edge of the collar. Uh, the patient have to visit you every, every three to six months, but actually the patient tolerated good and can live with it for life. Thank you so much. شكرا دكتور رامز شكرا محاضرة جميلة الحمد لله
اشكرك اشكرك برزنتيشن واضح وصوت جميل الله يفتح عليك استاذ الله يخليك الان الدكتور عصام بيرجع في الدي سي ار يس اعمل ستوب سكرين الدكتور رامز الغي السكرين شو تبعك اي ستوب شكرا Before I start uh, with the uh, uh, DCR, I just want to, to, to remind you of the injection of Botox in the lacrimal gland to decrease the secretion of the lacrimal gland. Uh, this can uh, be done by two ways, either transcutaneously through the skin or Transconjunctival. Transcutaneous is to inject just below the superior orbital limb at the junction of the middle and lateral third of the rim. How transconjunctively by double everging the lid and injecting into the palpebral lobe of the lacrimal gland. We usually start by 2.5 units of Botox with the 30 gauge needle. Uh, if the response is, is not enough, we can add, increase to five units. The patient usually takes the injection every four to six months. It, it lasts longer than Botox, the cosmetic Botox in the skin. Uh, the main difference, the transcutaneous is much easier, but there is an, an incidence of ptosis because you have you will have to go through the levator in order to reach the uh, lobe of the lacrimal gland. So this, is, this patient is, is actually a worker in our hospital. So uh, she was a good candidate for uh, all the studies. This is the transcutaneous. She develops mild doses. This is the transconjunctival. She's very happy. I've been doing this with her for over 20 years and we, uh, she has uh, crocodile tear syndrome, but we have been using now this for, as we said, for cases who uh, have uh, canalicular obstruction. Uh, Dr. Ramis, when he discussed John's tube excellently, just would like to tell you that uh, if you do a John's tube with a patient, this patient will live for you forever. John's tube procedure is known as uh, the Catholic marriage. There is no divorce. If you do it on a patient, you will have to take care of this patient for life. Uh, now let's go to uh, DCR. Uh, Dr. Ram has touched a very important issue. How to do a DCR and what anesthesia do you I use for DCR? And then we'll have questions while, while we go. DCR is a, a history uh, proven procedure. External DCR was first reported in 1904. Exact same technique, more or less, very minor modifications. It used to be said as a, a, a long procedure. No, DCR takes about 20 to 25 minutes. Bleeding procedure, Mostly no, and we'll, we'll go through the technique right now. A, a procedure that needs general anesthesia, definitely no. I only do DCR under general anesthesia in children. Adults, we, we do vitrectomy under uh, local anesthesia. We do all procedures under local anesthesia. And uh, actually local anesthesia results in much less bleeding than general anesthesia. So the standard of anesthesia in DCR everywhere is local anesthesia. Let's go through the steps. How do we do it? And uh, what do we need to do? How do we give the anesthesia for DCR? First, you put the patient on nasal, nasal decongestant uh, uh, one or two days before the surgery. Uh, you give him the regular sedation like you do in cataract or uh, vitrectomy, uh, metazolam or dormicum. 
okay sometimes better than it's fine you you put the oxygen uh, in his finger to monitor the vital signs the oximeter kulli kalam da is fine then we infiltrate the area of the surgeon local infiltration anesthesia with xylocaine and adrenaline okay this is the site of the surgery we inject around the site of the surgery with uh, 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 xylocaine with adrenaline uh, 1 to 2000 or 1 to 100000 okay and you do this for 5 cc you inject the whole area then you do two types of nerve block infraorbital nerve block how do i do an infraorbital nerve block the patient is lying flat i touch the uh, inferior orbital margin i look for the notch and then i go vertically one centimeter below the inferior orbital rim and the half of the inferior orbital rim here is the foramen and sometimes if you you aim correctly the tip of the needle will touch the nerve and the patient will feel like an electric impulse this is the exact right position and you inject 1 to 2 milliliter here this is the first type of nerve block so again you inject it in the area and then you do infraorbital nerve block and then you do anterior ethmoidal nerve block again the patient is lying vertically i'm sorry for the photo you go along the medial wall of the orbit just above the medial cancel tendon and you go half the length of the needle all needles are 1 inch the anterior ethmoidal nerve is about 12 mm from the orbital margin so half an inch so you go half the length of your needle and you inject a very good sign is paralysis of the medial rectus wait for one or two minutes ask the patient to look medially if the medial rectus is weakened or paralyzed your block is excellent you gave local infiltration infraorbital block anterior ethmoidal block then you need to anesthetize the nasal mucosa of the middle meatus we all know that DCR is a connection between the lacrimal sac and the middle meatus, not the inferior meatus. You either inject, like Dr. Ramis said, with a 30 gauge needle in, in the mucosa of the middle meatus, dilucane and adrenaline, or you pack. You prepare what we call pseudococaine, which is a mixture of xylocaine plus adrenaline plus. A bicarb, uh, and you wet a sponge or a piece of cotton, and you fill the nasal cavity with it, and you wait for five to ten minutes. Uh, the uh, America and uh, Europe, they do have cocaine. I used to use cocaine. But in the Middle East, if you ask for cocaine, you will be in jail. So we prepare pseudo cocaine. Uh, the most important thing is that after you give your anesthesia, you find something else to do for 10 minutes because you have to give the local anesthesia 10 minutes and for the vasoconstriction, 10 minutes to occur. Then you start your surgery. Where do I put my incision for a DCR? Let me make it simple. In this area, we have two types of skin. We have the thin skin of the lid and then we have the thick skin of the nose the only wrong thing to do is to have an incision that crosses both types of skin vertically or horizontally plastic surgery have taught us that if you cross two types of incision uh, skin with one incision you will get a scar so you either put your, your whole incision on the thick nasal skin or you put your whole incision on the thin lid skin. What I do is like in this photo, I do half a Z. I do a short horizontal limb just 
uh, above, uh, in front on top of the medial cancel tendon. How do I know is this is the medial cancel tendon? I just pull the skin medially and the tendon will stand up, will tighten, it will be seen. I, I make a short horizontal limb and then I make a longer vertical limb along the skin crease here. And all my incision is on the thin skin of the lid. Where is the angular vein here? The angular vein is just there. When I make the incision, the assistant will pull this side of the incision towards the nose medially. The angular vein is pulled with the hook medially. You will never get the angular vein. Okay, so this is the incision of the DCR. When I do the incision, I do skin incision, I will find the orbicularis. In this area, there is nothing except the orbicularis. You just dissect the orbicularis between the fibers, keep pushing the fibers on either side until you reach the periosteum. When you don't need to cut through the fibers, cutting through the fibers will, will cause unnecessary bleeding, so you don't need it. You keep pushing until you reach the periosteum. When you reach the periosteum, you feel your, with your finger, where is the anterior lacrimal crest? It is the round part of the bone that comes from the medial orbital margin to the inferior orbital margin. When you feel it, you make your incision in the periosteum just above the anterior lacrimal crest. And then with the periosteal elevator, you dissect under the periosteum pushing the lacrimal sac towards the eye, which is laterally towards the eye, and seeing the bare bone medially. The bare bone, which is the anterior lacrimal crest, the lacrimal fossa, until the posterior lacrimal crest. And then with the periosteal elevator, you move along the lacrimal fossa until you find the suture in the middle of the lacrimal fossa. The suture is the weakest part of the bone. So you try to find it, and at this place, you just hit with your uh, periosteal elevator. Most of the time, you will break the bone. This is all what you need to do. If you break the bone, you go in with the punch, and you start eating the floor of the lacrimal sac, including the anterior lacrimal crest. The patient is awake. He will not feel pain if you have given him proper uh, local anesthesia, but he will hear the cracking of the bone. So usually at this time, you ask your anesthesiologist to give more sedation just because of the sound of the bone cracking. After you do uh, the osteotomy, you will find the nasal mucosa. You will do the classic uh, incision, the edge-shaped incision in the nasal mucosa, dividing the nasal mucosa into an anterior flap and the posterior flap. I remove completely the posterior flap. I used to suture the posterior flaps. Now I don't. I just remove the posterior flap and I keep the anterior flap. Now I go back to the lacrimal sac. I inject viscoelastic through the punctum, as we agreed before. I fill the lacrimal sac with viscoelastic, and then I make my incision into the lacrimal sac, again, creating anterior flap and posterior flap. 100% I remove the posterior flap. And depending on the size of the sac, if the sac was enlarged, was distended, I remove more of the sac. All what I need from the sac is good anterior flap to cover uh, the uh, passage and to attach to the nasal anterior flap. I don't need the rest of the sac. When you open the sac, you, are, you actually also open through the nasolacrimal duct, through the orifice of the nasolacrimal duct. You need to curette and obliterate and fibrose the nasolacrimal duct. Because sometimes, if you leave the nasolacrimal duct, it will still collect discharge and uh, uh, fluids and cause 
what we call the sump syndrome post-operatively, which is al-mustanqa. Sump is mustanqa, is uh, ashwaiyat, uh, an area that has no uh, outlet that comes uh, uh, filled with fluid and discharge. So you get a, a calasian uh, curette, and you go through the orifice of the nasal lacrimal duct from the sac side, and you correct the mucosa of the nasal lacrimal duct to make sure that it will become fibrosed and the nasal lacrimal duct is 100% obliterated. Now let's agree on one thing. Where do I make my osteotomy? At what level? And at what level do I make my opening in the nasal mucosa? A lot of people will think that we need to do osteotomy and uh, uh, nasal mucosal opening in the lower part of the sac. This is wrong. You have to do this in the upper part, opposite to the upper part of the sac. Actually, opposite to where the common canaliculus is. Why? Because physics has taught us that water would like to move in straight lines in the plane of least resistance, Newton Al-Qaeda. Any fluids move in the plane of least resistance. If you make a common canaliculus at the level and you make your uh, DCR fistula at the lower level, tears will have to move from one level to the other and tears will not do that. This will cause recurrence of tearing and slowing of drainage, even with an open fistula. So you introduce a probe from the punctum, move it through the whole canaliculus, see where is the common canaliculus is at which level, and just opposite this level, you will make your cut in the nasal mucosa. Tears must move in one level. After you do your cuts in the nasal mucosa and in the lacrimal uh, system, and after you cut your posterior flap of both, you are now left with the anterior flaps. And you have to ask yourself a question. Do I need to put a stent? As we said, stents are not tubes. So they play no role in drainage. Actually, that stents are made of silicon. And you all know from retina that silicon is hydrophobic. Silicon does not like water. So actually, the presence of the stent reduces the flow of tears. All studies have shown that stents reduce the flow of tears. So why do we use them? We use them as stents to make sure that healing will occur in this direction in the, in the time where healing occurs in the first six to eight, sometimes to 12 weeks. Do I need to use a stent with every DCR? The question is no. We only use stents if needed. And there are three indications. If there is a problem in the canaliculus, upper or lower or common canaliculus, I need a stent. If the infection has been repeated and severe uh, uh, attacks of dacrocystitis, because this means there is a lot of fibrosis and you need a stent, or in recurrent cases. Fresh, classic DCR does not need a stent. Actually, stent will decrease your success rate in these cases. So, if you don't put a stent, you need now to suture both anterior flaps. You do this with six or five uh, uh, zero vicryl. And when you do this, the patient is lying down. The patient will not remain all his life lying down. He will stand one time. When he stands, the anterior flaps will tend to go down. If they go down, they can block your fistula. So we created one suture that we call tenting of the flaps. You all know what is a tent, khema. You all know shakl al-top bita al-khema. 
انه طالع لفوق زي تريانجل سو افتر سوتشرينج بوث فلابس توجذر وي تيك وان سوتشر ان ذا تو فلابس اند وي سوتشر ات سم وير اب either into the orbicularis or to the periosteum at a higher level, so the two flaps are not horizontal, but they look like a tent. And the role of this suture is to prevent rolling down or uh, stepping down of the flaps that may decree a uh, block your uh, fistula. If I'm going to insert the tube, I insert the tube before suturing the flaps, And after insertion of the tubes, I use a 4-0 silk suture without needles. And at the osteotomy, I tie both tubes together. Why do I do this? Because if the patient pulls the tube from the eye side, I don't want the tube to extrude, to come from above. The tube will never come from below. The tube, the problem was Uh, by canalicular tubes is that the patient can pull them from above. To avoid this, I, I tie both tubes together with uh, a silk suture, non-absorbable suture, just at the level of the osteotomy. If I'm done with all this, I don't suture the tubes to the nasal cavity. I don't need to actually. I just keep them uh, in the middle meatus in the posterior part of the middle meatus, uh, I sutured the anterior flaps, I now uh, suture the skin, I return the orbicularis, there is usually no need to suture the orbicularis, I just pull, uh, gather the muscle fibers back together, and then I suture the skin. When I suture the skin, I use the tip of the half Z, if you remember the half Z, if I put the tip of the half Z in place, I will have a short horizontal incision a longer vertical incision that will leave no scar. And I think this is cases without uh, scars postoperatively. This is the classic external DCR. Just as a quick note, so what is the role of nasal DCR? Uh, you will find a lot of talk about nasal DCR. Nasal DCR is a, a good procedure Success rate is 70 to 75%. They try to improve the success rate by doing several maneuvers, like inserting uh, a piece of gauze of gel foam to leave it, uh, are like doing uh, what we call redo or kemala, amalia kemala, like if you do redo for the LASIK, touch up, whatever these names. The problem is that with nasal DCR, you mostly do not. Uh, suture flaps. You create flaps, but you don't suture flaps. This lowers your success rate. Up till now, external DCR is the classic procedure for nasolacrimal duct obstruction. It is one of the very successful procedures in ophthalmology. Success rate is above 90, 95% in good hands. It's done under local anesthesia. It takes about 25 minutes. You don't need to put a tube. Uh, There's a lot we can speak about about the lacrimal system, but uh, I hope uh, this was beneficial. And uh, if there are a uh, few questions that we can answer th uh, through the chat, uh, please, Dr. Tari, uh, uh, decide and uh, let us know what, what you want us to uh, answer. Okay, shukran, Prof. Sam. MashaAllah, can you give me a hand on the media about lacrimal system? There is some questions. Are you hear me? Uh, there is some questions uh, in chat. Uh, yes. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, uh, one question. Uh, what's the role of message is to evacuate the sac or to induce negative pressure and open the handset valve? Yes, again, massage is not massage. Massage, we do not use it to evacuate. You will use the negative pressure to push fluid through the uh, sac and nasolacrimal duct, and this will burst Hasner valve open. As I said, 
if you do it well and if you do it frequently, sometimes while training the mother, you will hear a pop sound. This is Hasner valve that has opened and the patient has cured. So you really do not uh, need it uh, many times. You do not need uh, to evacuate the sac. You only need to properly block the punctum and canaliculi, increase negative pressure, suddenly release the pressure. The pressure should open uh, the uh, Hasner valve. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, how can you, uh, how can we get preservative free steroid? Uh, I, I prepare it. Uh, our pharmacy prepare it. You ask the pharmacist, it's so easy to prepare it. They have dexamethasone. Uh, you give them the concentration. They will do it with uh, saline or ringer and, and uh, uh, they prepare it. Mm -hmm. Okay. In canalicular laceration, do you prefer uh, big tail uh, uh, or binocular stent and get the tube uh, through the nose? Uh, laceration needs needs a uh, uh, lecture on its own uh, on the injuries, but. Uh, I don't use big tail. I don't use big tail. I think it is. it can be more traumatic. You have to be very expert to use big tail. And most people who do injuries are the residents in the emergency room. So I don't advise them to use big tail. OK, uh, another question. Zay Na'mal al in clinic. Uh, you do it fast. You hold the patient well with the mother and the father. And uh, it's much cheaper, it's easier, uh, it's quicker. Uh, I know that uh, uh, in the US there is always a debate, uh, is this human and ethical or not? Uh, I sometimes do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, what's the problem I of, uh, of osteotomy? Uh, again? The uh, broad size of uh, osteotomy. The proper size of osteotomy is uh, studies have shown that after six months, the osteotomy will be uh, almost 15 millimeter, it, very small. And all, this is all what you need. But we do a big osteotomy because by healing of the bone of the periosteum, it will end up in such a small. So they, they will tell you the tip of your little finger. Just remove at least half to uh, three quarters of the lacrimal uh, fossa, including the anterior lacrimal crest. Okay. Uh, what you prefer to do, nasal flap or uh, sac flap before? Uh, of breathing or because of breathing. Usually I do the nasal uh, flaps unless the sac is very big and has a lot of uh, fluid and uh, pus inside. So I would drain the sac first to make room for me to work. Okay, one question from uh, Marwan Farhan. What's the best management for bump failure? Ah. Uh. Now you've bought off in the lacrimal gland, but this, again, this issue has no clear cut uh, answer. There's no right or wrong. Uh, if, if the pump failure is, is, the lids are very weak, then you have to do a lid tightening procedure. Uh, if the lids are not that weak, then uh, maybe Botox in the lacrimal gland. Uh, some people would do DCR for pump failure because if you increase the size of the drainage, this will uh, improve the drainage. Uh, all these are schools and theories. There is no clear cut solution. Okay, what's the best uh, way uh, to start DCR? Uh, again, depending on how bad is the situation, but three years is, uh, you can do DCR starting from three years. Dr. Ahmed, can uh, you? 
دكتور عصام كان كان اي اد سمثينج اتفضل طبعا هو انا اي اي انا كنت بعمل دي سي ار اي اي اب تو غايه 2 اور 3 ييرز ستارتنج بس اي اي فيست 3 تايمز لاكريمال فيستولا ويعني كان كان كونجينيتال داكروسيد with lacrimal fistula, big lacrimal fistula, which cannot be treated by probing. And I've done DCR in three months child. I'm at time or two, three, and I found it's very useful. Of course, I know that we're talking about when we're going to do DCR for child three months. This is something, يعني maybe very early, but I was facing that I'm going to do it. I found that we're possible to do DCR in cases of emergency. في اللاكريمال سيستم لايك الانفكتد ميوكوسيل ساعات بتبقى انفكتد ميوكوسيل نوت ريزولفينج ويز ابسس وايفن باي تريتمنت السكين بيبقى ديسلوجد والباس طالع من السكين فوي كانوت بروف ذيس بيشنت فاكتشفت ان يعني اولا ماي تريتمنت ماي تريتنج باي تريتنج ذيس بيشنت ويز دي سي ار وانتيوبيشن ات جات مي ا جود سكسس ذيس از ماي اون اكسبيرينس ممكن تكون يعني بيوند الاكسبيرينس بتاع حضرتك او يعني مش قصدي ان هي تكون لا لا صح أكيد. اكيد اكيد انا 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 عملتها بس في الحالات الاميرجنسي اللي هي ويز انفكتد ميوكوسيد نوت ريزولفينج او نوت امبروفينج باي تريتمنت تمام يا صح اوكي اباوت كانيكولار ابستراكشن يو ويل تراي تري فاين ان اول تايبس بروكسيمال اند ديستال Proximal, how more distal? The idea it works more. The more you towards the sac, the the better the result. The shorter, I mean, it needs to be a short segment. If it's proximal, it's usually a longer segment. In the case of the Jones tube, it can be more. Based on the tool, the part that obstructs. The longer, go to Jones tube. The shorter, go to trifan. دكتور عصام كان ليه سؤال في في الديوريشن اوف ليفنج ذا تيوب حضرتك بتحب تشيل التيوب بعد هاو لونج؟ الناس بتقول 3 مانث الناس بتقول 6 مانث انا اي لايك ان انا اشيل ويز دي سي ار اند اف اي يوز ذا تيوب اي ريموف از ايرلي از اي كان يعني 8 ويكس 12 ويكس ماكسيموم لو كان اليكترال اوبستراكشن اي ليف ات لونجر 6 مانث لكن لو لكن لو لو كلاسيك دي سي ار ومن ومن وما فيهاش يعني كان ليك اوبستراكشن يعني 6 ويكس انف 6 ويكس از مور ذان انف في الفايبروزز الهيلينج ستيج بتمر ماكسيمم بتاعها از 8 ويكس سو يو دونت نيد اكتر من كده والعيانين بعد اكتر من كده دي كام كومبليننج اي هاف سم ديسشارج اي تيرينج بيحصل اجين ذا تيوب از ذا كوز وين يو ريموف ذا تيوب بي جيت بيتر ريليف Some patients have chronic nasal discharge or chronic sinusitis. How do you recommend to treat them before surgery or after surgery? Then it's hard to tell the patients who have discharge or who complain that they have discharge from the nose and they send them to a doctor for oxygen and treatment that is not enough or they don't get results. How do you recommend to treat it pre-operative or post-operative? Both. Both. اه يعني بخليه اي اسك هيم تو ستارت ذا تريتمنت وين اشوف الايفكت اوف ذا تريتمنت حصل امبروفمنت خير ما حصلش بروسيد ما حصلش امبروفمنت هضطر بروسيد برضه وانا اي كونتينيو اون ذا تريتمنت افتر وورد في الحاله دي اخلي مده التيوب اقل يعني احطها برضه 6 ويكس ولا اخليها مده اطول؟ بريفير وات اللي عندهم البيشنتس اللي عندهم كرونيك ساينسايتس او عندهم كرونيك نيزل بروبلم زي اتروفيك راينايتس I still keep the tube eight weeks, the usual. Maximum is 12 weeks. So if the patient starts at any time, I remove the tube immediately because I don't think it has any role. Okay, I have about one month. If the patient is complaining of the tube, I remove it after four to six weeks. Yes. Yes. Okay, I, I do agree with that. لما كنت لما كنت في الهند في الهند كانوا يبعدوا التيوب after six six week as a rule. باستثناء اذا كانت الحاله تروماتيك او ريكارنس فكان عندهم رول انه 6 ويكس ريموف تيوب تمام ذا ايرلير ذا بيتر دلوقتي ذا ايرلير ذا بيتر 
انا انا عجبني مقوله قبل الدكتور عصام قالها ان موضوع ليستر جونز تيوب بما انك اتكلمت عن ليستر جونز ان هو عامل زي كاثوليك مارج العيان قاعد مع دكتور ريليشن فور لايف سترو و تيوب ليستر جونز تيوب هي طبعا ريليشن بين بين العيان والدكتور فور لايف بس ماي ماي ريكومنديشن حاجه واحده ان انا لازم لما اول ما اشوف البيشنت فيرست تايم لازم اديسايد ينفع له ديس يعني هل هو سوشيالي ولا هو المينتال ستيتس بتاعه هي هي هيساعدني في ان هو يحافظ على التيوب ولا لا؟ لان في مش معقول ان انا هجيب مثلا واحد سوري بيشتغل في في الزراعه وفي الغيط وكانوت تيك كير اوف ذا تيوب واروح اعمل له سي دي سي ار او اركب له ليستر جونز تيوب فالبيشنت سيلكشن از فيري امبورتنت اذروايز العيان بعد كده هيجي مش هيقدر يستحمل التيوب ويطلب مني ان انا اخلعها فانا اي دو اي دو يعني لايك المقوله بتاعت الدكتور عصام في نقطه ان البيشنت كمان لازم احدد علاقتي بيه هتبقى مكمله ازاي هختار يعني زي ما العروسه بتختار العريس لازم هي كمان او العريس يختار العروسه لازم العيان اختار اختار امتى هعمل العمليه ولو الشخص اللي قدامي ده عنده كانريكولار ابستراكشن بس مش شايفه ان هو مش هينفع يعني يحافظ عليها اي ويل نيفر دو ات يعني اي نيفر دو سي دي سي ار في عيان اوفر 80 وبيقول لك ريميت هو مش هيف مش هينفع يتعامل معايا خالص. فده ده ماي ريكومنديشن في في السلكشن اوف ايه اوف تايب اوف بيشنت. جونز تيوب از از تيوب بتاعت يونج ايجز ذا اولدر ذا بيشنت ذا مور ديفيكلت تو دو جونز تيوب عليه فكر في حاجات ثانيه. جونز تيوب از لايف لونج بروسيدير فمحتاجه شباب شويه. عيان عنده 30 40 انما 70 80 دي از دازنت ورك معاه دكتور عصام كان ليا سؤال معلش ام سوري تو ديسرابت يو بالنسبه بالنسبه للتشيلدرن ساعات بيجوا في 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 انسنس عاليه تشيلدرن ويز كانريكال اوبستراكشن ساعات بيبقى عندهم البانكتم كلها مقفوله تشايلد عنده سنه سنتين ساعات بيبقى الابر واللور كانريكال مقفولين تماما وفايبروزد ومفيش فورس ان انا اعمل له بروبينج ولا اي حاجه في ناس كتير قوي بتقول ما نعملش ليستر جونز في سن صغير قبل سن 14 او 15 لان التشايلد ويل نوت توليريت فهل هل الكلام ده اوكي ولا ان انا اي هاف تو دو ات في الادلت ايج ولا اي كان دو ات ان تشايلد؟ اي هاف دون جونز تيوب ان ان شيلدر الحقيقه يعني انا ايف دون اباوت I used two two packs of John Stube. The pack here, 24. Yani I used 48. I'm now working on my third pack. Yani I've done, for example, 50, 55 pieces of John Stube in my uh, career, but not in children. So, how do you recommend? I'm 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 like you. I'm 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 يعني بيبقوا عندهم لاكريميشن سبيشال بيبقوا يونيلاترال عندهم كان ليكو ستراكشر تراي سيسلر تريفاين يعني في دول اي وود تراي سيسلر تريفاين باي اول مينز يعني اوكي ثانك يو دكتور عصام انا در كوتشن واتس اباوت ادهيشن اون تيوب سبيشالي اف بوث تيوب تايت توجيذر Definitely adhesions uh, can happen. Uh, we don't leave tubes anymore. We don't use tubes in all cases anymore. We know that tubes uh, are not as beneficial as we used to uh, understand our belief the man. Uh, remove tubes as early as you can. Don't put tubes if the case is simple and straightforward. Uh, well, it's liable to ان ده يحصل لو حصل uh, drain again اغسل تاني عشان تفتح الادهيجنز بسرعه look through the nose and try to remove uh, اي discharge على ال edges of the tube بس uh, again the advice now is less use of tubes shorter period for tubes سام سؤالي في موضوع less use of tubes حضرتك recommend the patient يكون without canalicular obstruction without history of inflammation this is the only without repeated several several attacks of bacteriocystitis هحط tube canalicular obstruction هحط tube recurrent surgery هحط tube طب عيان بداكوسيستو سليل و positive regurge without tube من غير inflammation من غير inflammation 
without you. خالص اعمل اعمل anterior flaps واشيل posterior flaps and leave him without you. ما فيش انسدنس ان انا انا تنتنج للانتيريور فلابس انا لازم اعمل تنتنج للانتيريور فلابس تنتنج اه اه انا بعملها اول ذا تايم دلوقتي خلاص طب وحضرتك لو لو يعني لو يعني البيشنت بشوفه فولو اب بعد بعد الدي سي ار من غير تيوب اون اون ريجولار بيزس فور هاو لونج I'm checking the patency of the nasolacrimal system. In usual, you'll see him within the first week, and then you ask for one month. You keep him on artificial tears to maintain flow through the uh, DCR for uh, three months. I keep them on artificial tears to make sure that there is always uh, water flowing through the uh, passage. Well, after three months, inshallah, I have the quiz to the I have some patients who shed the tube for the first 10 days after the surgery. I was thinking that when the tube is shed after the first 10 days, I have to make sure that I don't have any more surgery. So I saw that the eyes are going to survive or the lacrimal system is patent. That's why I agree with it. Even in the first two weeks, the tube was removed from the eyes. وكان كان كان كنا كنت كنت عامل انتيريور فلابس بلاقي ان النيزو لاكما سيستم بي اكشلي هو آه. هي بس كده ان عيانين كتير شدوها ولقوا ان ما حصلش حاجه فبدانا بداوا يفكروا بقى طب ما نحطهاش من الاول اند ذاتس هاو ات ديفلوبت اوكي انا ذا كوتشن يوزنج اوف كريزيان كوريتيك ان دي سي ار Using of air fandom? Keresian curate. Al curate. What we are afraid of is that after you do the DCR, the nasolacrimal duct, the upper part of the nasolacrimal duct, is what we call dead space. Space will be fluid with some discharge and it will be a swamp, a And this can cause Recurrent tearing can go even sometimes positive regurgitation. The cases it amalad DCR with quaisin. Inama when you press on the upper part of the nasolacrimal duct, tlay talay lak fluid min al pancre. What they are reported, kaza case. Fada zahar in the swamp syndrome. For now we remove the dead space, we obliterate the dead space by cauterizing or curating the upper part of the nasolacrimal duct through the sac cavity. So that it gets fibrosed and you obliterate the dead space. احنا كلنا عارفين من ايام general surgery ان as a surgeon you don't leave any dead space. Dr. Assam, can can they ask a question about the orbicularis weakness? يعني عيانين عندهم facial palsy. في ناس بتقول ان لو لو عملنا لهم Lister Jones tubes the tearing will improve. Of course. There are some studies that there is something. There are people who say that they have them associated with myomonitis or anterior blepharitis. If they if they are treated, they will improve. Definitely. All the words. I have to say that I have to treat them. In general, but it's beautiful. The first thing you said, Dr. Yadi Ramis, people are all aware of this now. And we all know about the muscle of Riolan, the part of the orbicularis that is present in the lid mark. One of the functions of the muscle of Riolan is to compress the meibomian gland so that it will get the meibomian secretion on the surface. This is the heart of the meibomian gland that is with every contraction of the orbicularis. This presses on the meibomian gland and duct and expresses meibomian. People who have orbicularis palsy, زي حالات facial nerve palsy أو severe lid laxity, the role بتاع muscle of riolan ده ما بيتعملش. فال بيحصل stagnation in meibomian فيجيلهم blepharitis and meibomian gland dysfunction. وبالتالي يدخلوا في tearing with symptoms of dry eye or breakup time. الكلام اللي حضراتكم عارفينه 
عشان كده في كلام كتير عن تقويه الاوربيتولاريس كعلاج للمايبوميان جلاند سفنج لدرجه ان بعض الناس بتقول ان الهيت ثيرابي اللي بتعمل دلوقتي لحالات المايبوميان جلاند فانكشن هو اكتشولي علشان بيمبروف الفانكشن بتاع المسل اوف ريولان كانك بتعمل لها جلسات فيزيوثيرابي ف الموضوع ده از فيري هوت توبيك دلوقتي عليه كلام كتير وستاديز كتير وتصوير المايبوميان جلاندز بالمايبوموجرافي ورانا حاجات كتيره من اللي بتحصل في المايبوميان جلاند ورانا الرول بتاع المسل اوف ريولان يعني حاجة كده بس ان بريف يبقى تريتمنت يا اما بحن بوتوكس عشان اقل التيرنج ممكن او ممكن نعمل سي دي سي ار وليستر جونز تمام او ان انا اتريت ماي بومين جلاند ديس فانكشن ابتدي بقى حضرتك يعني وات از ذا بيست يعني دول كلهم بيجوا بيوني لاترال تيرنج وكومن جدا وفي الاخر الواحد بيكتب لهم ارتفيشال تيرز وبيمشيهم فعايز اعرف الواحد يرجمنت مع البيشنت ويز فيشال بولسي You definitely without, have without to... sorry I mean, without lead problem يعني without ectropion without tamper stenosis أنا... without any problem بالظبط انا فاهمك يا دكتور رامي ديفينيتلي هتعالج المايبوميان جلاند ديسفانكشن دي ما فيش عليها اختلاف وخصوصا ان العلاج ما هوش سيرجري ده هيحسن لك نسبه منه ما تحسنوش اكتر من كده لو اولد ايج هت جو تورز انجكشن اوف بوتوكس لو younger age had go towards the Lester Jones tube and you discuss that with the patient but definitely في الحالتين لازم تعالج المسل اوف ريولان والمايبوميان جلاند ديسفانكشن these are difficult <تصفيق> cases يعني these are these are not cases that هتتحسن uh, uh, ب one procedure ولا هتتحسن بسهوله these are cases that needs proper examination تفحص فاكتور فاكتور تصور المايبوميان جلاند وتشوف الاماونت اوف دايلاتيشن في الدكتس والاستاجنيشن يعني this needs uh, uh, really expertise يعني ثانكس دكتور عصام ميرسي حضرتك بريكومند التريتمنت بتاع المايبوميان جلاند فانكشن فور هاو لونج افريج اللي هو 2 تو 3 مانث ولا لس؟ ذا مينيمم المايبوميان جلاند فانكشن ويل نوت امبروف الا بعد 3 مانثز بال الفيبرامايسن لوحده لازم يتاخد او الدوكسي سايكلين بيتاخد شهر، الجلسات العلاج الحراري بتتاخد على مدار ستة ل 8 اسابيع، الاوميجا 3 بيحتاج يتاخد ثلاث شهور، فيو كانوت جادج قبل على الاقل الثلاث شهور. ثانك يو دكتور عصام، ميرسي جدا، ثانك يو. في كان في طبيبين رفعوا يدهم، يرفعوا من جديد. دكتور طارق الموضوع مش هيخلص انتوا مش عايزين تتسحروا <تصفيق> خلاص <تصفيق> خلاص اذا نختم يا بروف لا لا تحت امرك لا اتفضل اتفضل فيها اخر سؤال اذا في سؤال واحد عاوز يرفع يده لانه كان في واحد رافع يده من اول اتفضل شكله موجود ولا خارج مش عارفين ما فيش رايز هاند ما فيش رايز هاند طب عمرو حماد طب عمرو حماد لو حضرتك هو رفع ايده اوكي بس انا مش عارف اعمل له ان ميوت ممكن يعمل ان ميوت لنفسه انا مش عارف انا مش عارف اعمل له ان ميوت عمرو حميد عمرو حميد ايوه خلاص بقى احنا كده ادينا له فرصته اهو خلاص دخل اهو اتفضل يا دكتور عمرو بتشكر حضرتك كده يا دكتور عصام على المحاضره الجميله جدا يا دكتور رامز انا اسف اذا كنت هعطل حضرتك شويه بس في الاسئله لكن آآ آآ بتكلم بس على البنكتم البنكتال سويلنج القديمه الموجوده حضرتك بلا فرصه قد ايه لغايه ما تبدا تدخل بسيرجري يعني نقدر نعمل بقى كل الستيبس اللي حضرتك قلتها تدي مثلا علاج تدي مرات فرصه قد ايه مثلا شهر ست اسابيع انت هتتابع يا دكتور عمرو بص دكتور عمرو انت الاول انا الاول بوقف اي ادويه بياخدها العيان واقول له ما تحطش ابدا اي قطره ولو عينك تعباك اغسل بميه بارده وتعالى لي الاسبوع الجاي وبعدين ابدا احطه على ستيرويد بريزرفاتيف فري وهشوف والله بيتحسن اي ويل كيم اون ات ما لقيتش تحسن ابدا بقى افكر اعمل بانكتال دايلاتيشن اعمل برفوريتد بلاج امشي في كل الخطوات 
بس اللي هيحكمك هو الريسبونس بتاع العيان العيانين اللي اساسا داكري توكسيتي هتلاقيهم بيتحسنوا وبيتحسنوا كويس يعني حضرتك مش يعني عايز في برضه مرض المرضى بيطول معانا شويه يقعد مثلا شهر والواحد بيبقى مش عايز ياخد قرار سريع بيحس ايوه ايه آه. المشكله؟ إيه؟ طالما بيتحسن في امبروفمنت ما تتدخلش جراحيه طالما في تحسن ابدا فكر في الجراحه لو لقيته بقى بيجي لك بقى لنا شهر ما بيحصلش اي تحسن ولسه بيدمع والبانكتم زي ما هو يبقى ساعتها تبدا تتدخل نعم as long as he is improving يبقى there is no need الحقيقة انك تجو على اي بروسيد تمام يا فندم توستك بتفضل بقى السيستم في الوقت الحالي ولا حضرتك لا بتبقى على الفلو كنترول الموجود دلوقتي يعني حسب انا عارف ان الموضوع الموضوع المادي مختلف شوية في عوامل في عوامل كتيرة بتفرق في التحكم العيان موجود فين والعيان ظروفه الاقتصادية ايه وهتشوفه تاني امتى يعني والتامين في الوت اوف 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 فاكتورز بتتحكم في قرارك لو انت بتتكلم على العلم بس يبقى ديفينتلي انك تحط بيرفوريتد بلاج احسن لانه uh, والله نفع نفع ما نفعش اهو البانكتم زي ما هو وديفينتلي يبقى البانكتو بلاستي هي اخر حاجه العيانين بتوعنا بيحبوا uh, يجيبوا من الاخر يقول لك لا انا مش عايز اجرب وافرد ما نفعتش وابقى ساعتها الناس دي اعمل لها البانكت بلاستي الريكتانجلر من الاول وخلاص ففي في طيب يعني في عندك حريه حركه شويه بتحكمها تمام يعني ستك لو لو عندك التو اوبشن بانك تعمل بانكت بلاست سيريس نيد او تعمل انتيوبيشن العاديه عشان تعمل بس استنت في المكان حضرتك بتفضل ايه؟ تعمل السيريس نيد ولا الـ يا بيرفوريتد يا بيرفوريتد بلاج يا 3 سنيب قبل ما ما اعمل انتيوبيشن لو هعمل انتيوبيشن هعمل الانتيوبيشن اللي في العياده اللي من غير ما ادخله عمليات ولا اديله انستيزيا اللي هي السيلف ريتين تمام تمام السيلف ريتين شكرا حضرتك جدا وشكرا على المحاضره الرائعه يا فندم شكرا لوجود حضرتك معانا شكرا شكرا اخر 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 اسئله مع الدكتور محمد عبد الغفار ونختم ان شاء الله اه السلام آه. آه. عليكم اتفضل اهلا وسهلا عليكم آه. شكرا لحضراتكم جميعا وشكرا دكتور عصام دكتور آه. عصام حضرتك لو انا هعمل حضرتك بروبنج لطفل صغير هل بمسكه في العياده اخلي اخلي حد يكتف الطفل معايا وادخل انا بالبروبنج اللي هو البروبر سايز واعمل بروبنج ولا حضرتك ولا حضرتك اصل انا ما سمعتش الاجابه انا اسف اه يا فندم بنعملها في العياده كده اه بس ما بلاش النبي حكايه نكتف ونعمل بتحسسنا ان احنا ب... بنعمل حاجه <تصفيق> غلط يس اتس ان اوفيس بروسيدير في العالم كله اتس ان اوفيس بروسيدير في كلام ضخم في العالم كله عن الايفكت اوف جنرال انستيزيا اون برين ديفلوبمنت اقروا عليها كده اكتبوا وهتكتشفوا ان واحده من اكثر العمليات اللي ريبورتد وخدوها في الاستادي على الايفكت اوف جنرال انستيزيا اون برين ديفلوبمنت از جنرال انستيزيا في الكونجنتال نيزو لاكريمال داكت اوبستراكشن لان هي فيري كومن بروسيدير واحده من الكومنست انوماليز في الجسم وبالتالي بتوع الهيومن رايتس بيقول لك ات از ماتش بينيفيشال فور ذا كيد تو هولد هيم هو مش هيفتكر راذر ذان انك تدي له جرعه انستيزيا وتافكت هيز برين ديفلوب انا عايز اسالكم سؤال سيركمسيجن هاو دو وي دو سيركمسيجن في الميدل ايست في العياده بالظبط بدون جرعه انستيزيا تمام تمام تفتكر ويتش از مور تروماتيك سيركمسيجن ولا الكونجنتال نيزو راكيمال داكت بروبينج؟ سيركمسيجن بالظبط كده يبقى اتس نوت ا باد ايديا ات اول ات از مور بينيفيشال فور ذا كيد تو دو هيم از ان اوفيس بروسيدير ويزاوت جنرال اناسيز احنا كنا في الديبيت ده السنه اللي فاتت في الامريكان اكاديمي ودخلنا في الديبيت ودخلوا في الافكس ال الزملاء الامريكان والزملاء واحنا والزملاء الاسيويين ربنا عليهم وات واز ذا بيجست ديبيت في الاوكيلو بلاستي السنه اللي فاتت. تمام تمام شكرا شكرا لحضرتك شكرا شكرا شكرا, شكرا شكرا دكتور عصام الله يفتح عليك ما شاء الله كانت ساعتين جميله جدا تكلمنا تكلمت عن كل حاجه انت والدكتور رمزي عن السيستم فروم اي تو زد المحاضرات موجوده على اليوتيوب اتوقع ستكون مرجعيه لكل الاطباء اللي 
يبحث عن اي معلومه عن الاكل مال سيستم اشكر حضرتك دكتور طارق واشكر دكتور رامز واشكر كل الزملاء اللي كانوا موجودين معانا وكل عام وانتم بخير ورمضان كريم باذن الله على الجميع شكرا دكتور طارق شكرا دكتور عصام ميرسي جدا محاضره جميله وتقدم ان شاء الله باذن ربنا كل سنه طيبين كلكم ان شاء الله نجهز لحاجه قريبه ان شاء الله خلال الاسبوعين القادمه ونقول لكم ان شاء الله الله يفتح لكم كل سنه طيبين شكرا جزيلا السلام